So folks, um, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Jason, the VP of Business Development here at Super Annotate. Uh, and I'm joined by a few folks, um, most notably Oscar. He's our AI Solutions Lead. This is actually the second webinar in our series of how to supercharge your ML pipelines uh, using Super Annotate. And for this webinar, we're going to be specifically focusing on, you know, what are some best practices for building scalable uh, data annotation pipelines, uh, boosting labeling quality, and really accelerating time to model. Uh, now, this session will be recorded, and so we'll send uh, an email recording to, uh, to everyone shortly after the call. Um, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A, uh, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the session. We'll have a separate Q&A session and, and you know, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can after the call. Of course, at the end of this call, if you'd like to learn more about what we do at Super Annotate, please, please definitely don't be shy about contacting us. Our email addresses are right here on the page. And of course, you can respond to any correspondence we send you. Now, I know many of you know who we are at Super Annotate. Uh, but for those who don't, at Super Annotate, our goal is really to help companies build the highest quality data sets for computer vision and NLP. And we're really able to do this by bringing together advanced tooling, ML and workflow automation, deep pipeline integrations, our integrated services marketplace, and uh, our best in class AI customer success. With Super Annotate, companies can build better performing models faster than ever all while streamlining their data pipelines. And of course, we're lucky and honored to be working with some of the best companies across the world and across so many different industries like robotics, insurtech, retail, automotive, agriculture, just to name a few. Now the company was founded in 2018 and we've raised nearly $20 million to date uh, from folks such as Point9 and Base10. We were recently named as one of the top 100 AI companies in the world by CB Insights, and one of only three in the data labeling cat uh, category. We've also got some wonderful advisors, some, some names you may be familiar with, uh, like Peter Rabiel, Trevor Darrell, and Gary Bradsky. You know, our, our product, our platform, it really consists of three core pieces. First, there's the annotation software with advanced tooling and QA, robust data management, uh, acceleration and automation features, um, and then a robust pipeline for a robust API for deep pipeline integration. Then on the other side, uh, you have our curated services marketplace where we've screened uh, at this point, about 350 different service companies across the world, and we've selected the top 35 to be in our marketplace. They're all professionally managed, which means you don't have to suffer through crowdsourcing, and they're all trained on Super Annotate so that they can leverage all of the platform features for our client's benefit. Now, the third piece is our AI customer success program, where our team of expert ML and DevOps engineers, annotation experts, and project managers act as an extension of your team to help manage, optimize, and execute your data labeling initiatives. We'll talk more about this later today. Bringing these together, we've built a unified annotation environment, optimized to provide the best integrated software and services experience, leading to higher quality data and more efficient data pipelines. You know, something that we truly believe here at Super Annotate is this idea that data is the new source, is the source code for ML. And we were actually talking earlier today about who came up with this concept first. So if anyone knows or remembers, please feel free to drop it in the chat uh, and we'll send you a t-shirt or something, uh, something else, depending on where you live, whoever's first. Um, but I think generally, the, look, this idea is really powerful. Um, if we consider all the systems, processes, tooling, the expert help and guidance that we get for building general software. Uh, you know, we need to start approaching our ML data sets with the same level of precision. 
You know, and look, we all know that the ML industry is in its infancy compared to general software development. And so today, building scalable ML and data labeling pipelines is hard, which is why throughout our time working with hundreds of clients, spending hundreds of thousands of hours annotating, we've identified the most common reasons why companies struggle to build high quality training data and efficient data pipelines. And in turn, we've developed a number of our of our own best practices for how companies can overcome these challenges and build super scalable pipelines, build consistently high quality data and accelerate time to model. And we'd love to share these pitfalls and best practices with you all here today. Uh, and we'll also share a little bit about how Super Annotate helps companies be successful in all of these areas. Now, during this webinar, we'll cover the following topics. First, we'll discuss getting started and what to consider at the onset of this process. Next, we'll go into product design, uh, project design, and talk about you know, how to do things like build guidelines. Um, after that, we'll go into project implementation. So how do you put your plan into action? We'll follow that up by talking about leveraging the right software. And then finally, we'll discuss uh, you know, selecting the service provider. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have Q&A. So getting started, you know, when getting started, it's really important to have a solid understanding of what is the current state of your annotation and ML pipeline, as well as the goals for the future. You know, a great place to begin is by thinking about what are some of the existing challenges that you have here today? Then, you know, once you have a handle on the current state, you can begin to ask, you know, what does success look like both in the near term uh, and the long term? You know, one question that we like to ask our clients uh, in every engagement is, what does your ideal outcome look like? Where do you want your pipelines or your, you know, annotation processes? Where do you want those to be in six, 12, 24 months from now? You know, once you have that, once you have a vision of that, it makes it much easier to build and execute your plan. So, some of the key factors that we think are important to consider as you go through discovery, discovery process are the following. The first is annotation quality. Of course, this is probably an obvious one because everyone wants super high annotation quality. And unsurprisingly, this is probably the one we get the most you know, requests for from clients. But really where it gets tricky is around understanding what are the levers that you can pull, that you should pull to get high quality and going forward. How do you consistently deliver high quality? How do you do this in a timely manner? And what happens as you scale and volume increases? The next is speed. Clients will often tell us they want faster annotations. And to that, we often ask, well, is the goal really just to get data back faster? Or is it also to have faster time to model? Are you solving for this very specific issue? Or is there a broader desire to speed up your entire ML development and data pipeline cycles? Because annotating is annotating quickly is really only one part of this idea of getting faster time to model. And in Super Annotate, our goal is not just to turn around annotations incredibly fast, but it's to equip you with the systems and the processes uh, and the infrastructure to dramatically improve time to model. Because at the end of the day, I think that's what we're all aiming for when we think about speed. Then there's repeatability. You know, another big part of scaling is making sure processes are repeatable. Do we have cadences that we want to keep? Can we ensure that uh, we can keep these cadences as we scale? And if so, you know, what are the systems and processes that need to be in place to do so? Then there's uh, you know, the topic of data management. How are you planning to manage data? Who needs access to the data? How will you run experiments and how will you get insights? Data versioning, things of that nature become critically important as well. Then, then you have to start thinking about the future and future-proofing your pipeline. What are the long-term goals? And is your pipeline built to handle all the changes that happen between where you are today and where you're gonna be in the future? What happens when model performance becomes harder? You really need that, you know, super, those super high quality annotations to get there and you still need to meet your delivery cadence. And then the last one is this idea of getting the most out of your team. And this is often one that we see that clients overlook and undervalue. What we mean by this is, 
The idea of getting the most out of your team is making sure that your the folks on your internal teams are doing uh, the things that they that, that that they're best at and that they're as efficient as possible. For example, are your ML engineers spending a lot of time on non-ML tasks? Are data managers uh, doing manual tasks that should be automated? Are product managers spending too much time uh, overseeing the annotation process? And so, you know, if you can find ways to get your existing team to manage three or more, three times or five times or 10 times more data, uh, be made way more efficient and way less stressed out, you know, are those wins. Because at the end of the day, I think what we want is annotation and ML pipeline owners to be thinking, how do we build a pipeline that provides high quality, uh, efficient development cycles, super repeatable cycles that's built for the future and really provides the most value to the team. You know, next we'll talk about project design. And this is, you know, an area uh, that we tell folks to really look at. And the first place to start here is with annotation, instruction, and guidelines. This document goes by a bunch of names, uh, but we think of them as the document that outlines what are the rules and steps needed for the data labeling process. And in this section, we're gonna cover uh, the following key considerations uh, to think about when designing annotation instructions. Uh, the first is really, you know, understanding uh, the outcome of the final product. The next is thinking about edge cases and the level of detail. After that, we'll talk about tribal knowledge. And then we'll talk about this idea of the best possible approach. And so I'll pass it on to Oscar. Oscar, can you go ahead and cover the first couple? Absolutely. Um, so this first point about understanding the outcome, I think it's important for the ML engineers to have a clear understanding of the actual end goal use case of the model itself. How this sync with the, if it's the product team or someone else who are actually gonna implement the model in some kind of product. Because this will propagate throughout the annotation pipeline as well. Like the annotations should be a representation of the perfect model of performance, right? That's why we call it the ground truth. So actually having a very, very thorough understanding in the beginning when starting up a project, what is the actual outcome of the model? What will we use it for? What are their needs? Super important. So it's worthwhile to you know, spend a lot of time here in this area to make sure that you get this right initially because you must understand if uh, is quality the most important thing is, do we need exactly more data in this case, but perhaps not as high quality or what features do we need to do in this case? So to have that understanding and then transfer that to the instructions document will be super important. So that's also where you come into the kind of instructions with the edge cases and level of detail because you might as the model builder, the CV engineer, ML engineer, you know, you know everything about this, but when building this at scale, you will not be doing the annotations anymore. So there will be a need for syncing the um, outcome to a instruction document and write down all of these things. So you know what we're actually gonna do during the labeling process. So there we, it's very important to do things like, you know, give examples. This is what it should look like. This is what it should not look like. Uh, provide other examples, for example, with a lot of edge cases and um, cover these kind of ambiguities where we are in the middle of two different classes or some things that might not be very obvious at first glance. So to really, you know, go through the data set, thoroughly look through it, look for these ambiguities and uh, make sure to cover all of that in the document you're providing as well, because I think that's a very key thing and worthwhile to spend time on in the beginning. And it's important, it's in, in, interesting to see how many things can be overlooked and uh, thought to be obvious. And I think that sort of brings us to the next part of this as well. Yeah, no, so the, the tribal knowledge, I, I think Oscar, thank you very much for all, for all that information. And so Oscar is kind of referring to this concept of tribal knowledge. and you know, I think maybe you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't, um, but how many of our clients come to us uh, and they've been annotating for a really long time, labeling for a really long time, have built very sophisticated models and critical parts of their instructions are either not thoroughly documented or not documented at all. And 
you know, for, for many of our clients, even the ones, as I mentioned, with, with extensive uh, processes, there's often a lot of tribal knowledge. And now Oscar talked about these. These could be rules or edge cases that were left out or things that are in just incorrect, but were never uh, corrected. And now this works oftentimes at first, uh, but as you start to scale, you start to realize how painful this becomes. Uh, you know, information gets lost. Uh, it's, you know, communication with your annotation team is difficult. Uh, results are inconsistent. Uh, and at the end of the day, quali quality of your data, quality of your models suffers. Uh, and as does time to model, because you start going through lots of revisions. Um, and so the cost can be pretty high. Now, there's this last concept that I want to hit on called uh, best, the, the, the best approach and, and, you know, the optimal design. And it's important, you know, what, to really consider after the instructions are written, but before you deploy them, you know, did we take the best possible approach? And did we catch all of the errors uh, to uh, all of the edge cases? Um, you know, at Super Annotate, our AI customer success team works closely with all of our clients to conduct an extensive review of their instructions. During this process, we often find a number of ways to improve the instructions, whether it's uncovered edge cases, areas for significant clarification and consistency improvements, uh, sometimes whole process improvements, uh, and so on. And it's, it's this area where we can bring our experience working with so many different data set creations, uh, creation use cases, and, and start introducing the client to some of our best practices, maybe new methods of annotation, uh, QA, or, or just general thinking. You know, in fact, during uh, our instruction review process, we find on average, uh, 17 areas where actually the instruction, instruction can be improved. Um, and, you know, these could be anything from these small things like, you know, minor inconsistencies or tiny edge cases to changing the entire approach, such as letting a client know, hey, look, you don't need your bounding boxes to be that tight. You can, they can be a, a looser and you can actually annotate 5x faster and save 5x the cost or annotate five times more data set on the same budget. Another area that companies often overlook is how their instructions are implemented in practice, right? So even when constructions, uh, even when instructions are complete, there's a lot that goes into the implementation process around project setup in the platform, workflow setup, uh, specific annotation steps, and so on. You know, for example, how should uh, an annotation team interpret the instructions that have been written? Most often, the instructions have been written by a data expert or a, or a CV or ML engineer. And so how do you take that and then put it into uh, content that can be easily interpreted by, by annotation teams? You know, or how should a project be set up in the platform to optimize for speed and optimize for quality while minimizing mistakes? Now, in this table, you can see there's the standard trade-off at the beginning between speed and quality. But as you start thinking about, you know, uh, proper implementation, you can start dramatically improving this relationship between speed and quality. Uh, you know, we talked about it in the previous example, but creating instructions that are easy to interpret, you know, can get you a boost uh, in quality. Or if you can set up the project and platform uh, and add processes that have guardrails, that minimize errors, that maximize speed, you can get another lift. Then through automations, uh, integrations, and things like that, you can start boosting that trade-off even further. Um, you know, and, and this is something that I want to mention at Super Annotate. Uh, this is another area where our AI customer success team gets involved. We handle this implementation process for our clients, everything from the instruction interpretation, assisting with setting up the processes in the platform, adding automation steps uh, and automation features using our SDK and all of these things, uh, to help really improve um, the processes for, uh, for our clients. And so, you know, these are just some statistics that, that, we've, that we've seen with, with some of our clients, but by, by optimizing project implementations, we've helped companies get 12 to 15% better performing models and, you know, sometimes 80, even 90% reduction in annotation cycle time.
So now let's talk about software. Um, you know, many companies, I'm sure there are plenty of folks here on this call have home, homegrown or open source tools that are using. Um, you know, but as you try to scale, key features like QA, project management, ML features and integrations um, can become really critical areas where in-house and open source tooling is lacking. Uh, it can cause companies to suffer for, through pains for a while uh, before finally deciding to upgrade you know, software stacks. And you know, we really encourage folks to be thinking about this uh, and thinking about these features early on, especially if you have plans to scale in the future. And so when, when thinking about software, there are several you know, key ideas to consider. And they include collaboration and project management. You know, software should have really strong project management and collaboration capability. As you scale and you bring more diverse projects into your pipeline, it's really important to ensure that the uh, platform and that your processes are flexible and efficient and you can manage and organize everything in multiple projects and multiple workflows. In addition, you wanna be able to communicate with the team on the platform, track performance, uh, and really understand what's going on with a high level of granularity. The next is QA. Uh, you know, software should have a really well-designed QA process. Things like multiple user roles, ability to track statuses of images or data points, you know, ways to comment and communicate within that QA processes, uh, and things like approving specific instances and so on for more detailed QA. Um, the goal is obviously to get higher quality data, faster revision, uh, and better end results. I'll pass it on to Oscar to cover the, the next two areas of, of this area, of this topic. Thank you. So I think uh, I'll actually start with the bottom one with automation there because it's really interesting to think about it. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile to have that idea initially, you know, when you're looking at your project and think, can we automate any part of this? Can we, for example, integrate any ML feature to help speed up the kind of labeling process that we are doing? It's not always the case, uh, especially when you're starting out a new project. If you're in a totally new domain, it will be you know humans in the loop who will actually help there first. But it's worthwhile to think about because there could be examples where you are integrating an existing model, for example, you know to give outputs that could be treated as pre annotations. So instead of just doing everything from the ground up, you are mostly correcting mistakes from your model. And that really helps you instead focus on the areas where your model is not performing as well instead of the things where it already predicts quite accurately. Um, more than this, like similar is also related to things like, you know, other ML methods like active learning as well, to really help you choose which data points to label. And we had a previous webinar all about that. So check that out as well. But uh, it's more than just ML features. So if we go back to kind of the pipeline integration, that is also part that can be automated in this fashion, not really with automation with ML features, but instead of having automated the things like project creation, upload, think about how you would like to structure that. Because as I think most of us know, you know, people working in ML data science, spending a lot of time on data, you want to spend time on models and uh, the deployment and making sure all of the other things work. So we want to make sure that you have a good setup in terms of the pipeline integration for your data. So transfers are easy and uh, everything else go hand in hand basically. So that's why it's important to understand the software on the kind of SDK API side to make sure that you have an effective tool to work with when it comes to automation features. And using an API in SDK also gives you flexibility in uh, creating project setups. Like you can be more creative when setting up how to do things and uh, really organize a workflow for your project that is actually optimal and includes these automation features. So you don't have to manually take care of a bunch of different stuff. I think another thing related to this, not really pipeline integration, but the next part here about data management is that when working on these things, you know, you're annotating data sets, it's important to also version them. I think that's coming more and more like we are versioning models. Of course, source code is versioned and now we are versioning models, but you should also version your data sets because you wanna make sure that when you actually benchmark your models to find the optimal one, you make sure that you train on the same data set. 
that might seem obvious, but in all cases, it's not obvious in all cases. And it's a good, it's a good practice to have that in mind and also make sure that you might add new data points in the future. You should always improve your data sets. But what if you add something that is not really contributing to your model performance? Well, by versioning your data set, you make sure to also have that, those bases covered, so to say. Another thing as well related to data management, and I think an important thing in general with software is for the ability for you to curate your data set. It really comes into from the ML engineer's perspective or the CV engineer, where not only should you review your data set on like, I have 10,000 data points, but also curate your data set. As we talked about before, the data will be the source code of your model. You do want to see what you're actually dealing with. If you would be labeling it, you would be in that process doing everything. You would see everything firsthand, but now that's off your table. We love people who like to collaborate and be part of the kind of QA process we are running. But we also understand that you have better things to do on your time and actually spend time labeling the data. So having an easy way to curate your data set, overlook them, see like what are my annotations actually look like? What does data represent? That really will become what will my model learn? So to have those things, you know, I think that's a really important part to have there as well. Great. Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Oscar. And, and you know, this, this idea of these, these automation features, ML, uh, features, uh, things around curation and and um, and data management. These are areas, folks, that we're also really investing heavily in. You know, we hear from our clients often that these are things that are super important to them. And so we've tried to do a lot to, to kind of build uh, our platform to incorporate a lot of these things. And so, um, you know, we really feel like this is something that's going to be important as as this area matures and, and, and as people go and start scaling their pipelines. You know, there's one more... Uh, one area that you mentioned, Oscar, that I really want to focus on, which is this, this idea of integrations, APIs, SDKs. I think this is something that a lot of our clients are super excited about. I think today we have close to maybe 80% of our pro clients using our SDK uh, for some form of automation. And, you know, as we look at what folks are using them for, uh, you know, there's a lot more that our clients want to do with, with our SDK and can do. Um, you know, we, uh, there, we have a number of clients that are actually, you know, using our SDK to integrate super annotate, you know, just drop us into their entire pipeline and really automate, um, a ton of manual tasks that, that they were doing before. Uh, and so what we've seen actually is we've had clients that have been able to free up the equivalent of, you know, let's say one to two ML engineers time improve productivity of data team by two to three X. Um, and all of these things through leveraging, you know, our SDK and automation and integration. Um, so the last area I'll cover before we kind of get to Q and A is this concept of, of uh, selecting a, uh, a service partner. Um, and I'm sure folks who've gone through this process, they've, you know, they found that this can be the most time consuming, painful and frustrating part of the process if it's unsuccessful. On the other hand, it can be one of the most rewarding and positively surprising processes if done right. Um, you know, we get a lot of companies that have had unsuccessful stints with annotation service providers. They come to us because they wanna replace them. Um, and generally speaking, we see that these companies suffer really from four key pitfalls. The first one is failing to consider or underestimating the importance of project management and customer success. Now, many companies who switch to super annotate do so after having bad experiences uh, from a customer success and a project management standpoint with other vendors. We frequently hear things like vendors not being communicative or taking a long time to, to have a communication or have a correspondence, you know, missed delivery timelines, uh, you know, the lack of ML or annotation expertise, uh, the fact that in cases they not only don't uh, understand enough to improve the project quality, but overall generally weren't adding value. Um, sometimes it's the fact that 
an annotation service partner is a black box. You just send data away and you get data back and there's no way to get visibility into that process. Um, and so, you know, ultimately when these things happen, uh, it makes working with providers like that, you know, challenging at best and it can be a total nightmare at worst. Obviously quality of deliverables suffers. Um, then it leads to performance of whatever key product you're building uh, suffering and that costs the company valuable time, valuable resources and of cost and of course um, money. So really it's critically important to find a service partner who can be a trusted partner, somebody with strong communication uh, and can really help add value. And it, it's really a, a big reason why we've invested so heavily in designing our AI customer success program because we wanna provide the expertise and the support to go above and beyond what our clients need in all of these areas related to guidance, uh, project management, ML expertise, and, and so far the feedback from our, from our clients has been incredibly positive in this area. The second is you know, software expertise and overlooking the role of, of software expertise. You know, it's not just enough to have a software platform that you wanna use. There's actually a huge benefit that you get when your service provider has a deep understanding of the platform and its abilities. This allows you to fully leverage every small feature and every hidden feature available to deliver better outcomes. Annotators move faster, project setups are more robust, quality is better, and the experience is, is, is significantly improved. Now, the third thing I wanna talk about is, uh, you know, inability to future-proof your, uh, your you know, ML and, 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 uh, and, and annotation process. You know, companies that are unsuccessful in, the, in, in this part of the, uh, you know, partner selection process, oftentimes, you know, part of it is because they didn't consider future-proofing their pipelines uh, at an early stage. You know, you pick someone who's might be low cost and, uh, and, and someone who you want to work with on some experiments. But then as you start thinking about scaling, you realize you're stuck with all of this technical debt or this knowledge debt from working with tooling or, or uh, you know, service companies that won't scale uh, and folks that don't necessarily have the expertise to handle the next steps in your uh, ML journey. And the last one I'll talk about is this idea of cost versus ROI. You know, often when we talk to companies, folks get really hung up on the cost of the actual annotation work. How much does it cost to annotate a specific instance? Um, you know, for those folks, when they wanna scale, um, there's a really good chance that they're gonna have a tough time doing it. The reason is there is so much more value that can be created through the partner that you choose. You know, let's say for example, you have one partner that is $10,000 less expensive. Um, or you have another partner that can help you get 2% better model performance. Um, you know, that could mean multiples more in value for the project. Uh, or, you know, what if there's a, a provider that can, you know, free up an ML engineer, to go back and do ML things instead of managing annotation work. Or if you can have your existing data team manage five times more data than they were currently managing without increasing the strain or 50%, you know, faster time to model. You know, we, we as buyers uh, often forget this and, and it happens, you know, for us, when we do software buying as well, when we do, when we, when we go out and buy software, we run into this problem too. We forget sometimes that the money that we're spending is supposed to be an investment in our business. And so we really encourage folks, instead of focusing on the immediate cost, focus on the ROI. Now to wrap it up, I wanna thank everybody for attending. We've worked with, at this point on tens of millions of annotations. Uh, we've received feedback from our hundreds of, of different customers and clients and have tried to pull this information together. I really hope folks found it useful. Um, I know that internally we've taken all of the feedback that we've gotten from everyone we've worked with into consideration. Uh, and so everything uh, from our platform, our integrated services offering, our AI customer success program, it's all built with that in mind. Uh, and so now we'll move on to Q&A.
Great. Great. Oh. We have any questions? Any questions from anyone? There were a couple that we asked privately in the chat, but um, does anyone else have any questions? If not, awesome. Well, folks, thanks again, everybody, for attending. It's really been a pleasure to host all of you. Uh, we really hope to see you on the next one and enjoy the rest of your day. I think we got some questions here. <laughs> oh, we do? Okay. Yes. Just kidding. All right. So, Jason, is there any question you'd like to answer here or should I answer some of them? Uh, yeah, yes. If there's a question you wanna you wanna answer, please do. There is one question here, All right? There's one question about uh, AI assistance when uh, for labelers when annotating the data, um, and I think that's an interesting point. Uh, it sort of ties into the ML features or AI features to help speed up the labeling. And I think there are many different ways to do this. They, there exist things out there, like we have our own proprietary segmentation model to help speed up uh, semantic segmentation projects, for example. And uh, we are also leveraging model assisted labeling or you know, leveraging either pre existing models, clients' model any type basically, or creating one for a specific project to help speed up the labeling. But I think it's, you always have to think about the cases of the area I'm trying to annotate in. If we would have a perfect automated annotation process, we would not need to do annotation. So that's the first thing, but you can leverage it in a couple of cases. For example, if you have, you know, a simple use case could be you're doing object detection trying to detect objects in the image. If you have multiple of these in the same image, you might have high confidence on one class. When you predict those, that's fine. Don't need to change them. But the other class, which you have low confidence on, when you do those predictions, a human can come in and change those predictions and correct it. So there you can use like model assisted or AI assisted labeling in our platform, for example, for these kind of cases. Great. Um, and there was another question about uh, whether or not we work in the uh, autonomous vehicle area. And the answer is yes. Yeah, we definitely do. We've done a number of things with, uh, with various customers. Um, and so if that's something that's of interest, um, you know, definitely reach out and let us know. Great. Great, yeah. Um, Great, it looks like uh, all, I think, unless anyone else have any questions. Wonderful. Great. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And again, uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.